Hello, sir. How's it going? Very good, thank you. How are you? Living the dream, man. Living the dream. So sorry, today for me it's a bit of a manic because my daughter's birthday. So my wife making hundreds of cakes for school, allergies. This can eat, eat this, this cannot eat this. So I got like seven different cakes for her to school. So <laughs> ah. <laughs> I get it, man. I understand. I'm uh I don't have any kids, but I can imagine that would be uh a lot. Um so I read this book, Sensei Thank you. Bars and Scars. Thank you. And I'm finding myself um, very many things parallel, although education system completely different. And uh -huh. I'm going to start with this. Um, I always thought that all that kind of bullying culture in states is only on the movies. But reading your book, it's just movies are the documentaries, right? Yeah, I mean... So it's kind of funny. We've been working on a documentary about frauds in the martial arts industry, right? But the reason I bring that up is because there is a quote that our um, our head of cinematography was talking about. And he said that when you're making a movie, um, the director is God. But when you're making a documentary, God is the director. And uh, I'm not a super religious person, but I thought that that was a very insightful quote. And so that's kind of like how I think film dictates what life is. And uh, it's not like those things are just made up. Most likely, in most film, you can recreate or reproduce. Hell, even sci-fi movies, right, are usually precursors to real technology that happens down the road. So, you know, when it comes to my particular life and what I've written in that book, I had to deal with a lot of bullying in school because of my cleft lip and palate that I was born with. And there are a lot of people who had to deal with it who didn't have any physical or visible disabilities. So it's a very strange thing to think that it's almost a breeding ground when you get from elementary school to middle school, the night and day parallel and difference. When elementary school, there really aren't like cliques. Everybody just kind of hangs out with everybody. But by the time you get to middle school, there are already athletic programs and clubs and societies so you go and like, here's the football team and they hang out together. There's a baseball team. They hang out. Here are the gothic kids. So it's a whole new world when you go in. And if you don't fit into one of those categories, you're kind of exiled. And I don't think that's unique to the United States, to be honest. Like I've been all over the world. I think that it's very common for people to make fun of or to outcast things that they themselves are not a part of or don't believe in or don't associate with. So I think that that's just common around the world. I just happen to get my ass beat for it. <laughs> so I, I just, uh, you know, because we are, we, of course we had the bullying in, in, in Poland and stuff, but um, reading your book, it seems to be that it was nearly a kind of not disproved. Um, it was nearly approved by the teachers, right? You said that the, some teachers didn't react at all. They stood when you've been beaten up and stuff in Poland. If we've been caught, uh, or somebody was caught bullying somebody, the, the teacher would tear us apart. You yeah, know? you would hope. Uh, I think that there's there's something to be said about it takes a village to raise a kid. I think that that's an important thing. I think that as a society, if we all are looking out for each other's best interests, you're most likely to do that. Um, the problem is, is that uh, at the time, it seemed like a lot of people were looking out for themselves, not looking out for the best interests of others. So the teachers, I'm assuming, just based off of the way that things were going, I didn't write about this in the book, but my assumption is, is that at that time, there were teachers who were getting in trouble for breaking up fights and they'd leave a bruise on a kid, they'd get sued and get fired. Or they'd break up a fight and then all of a sudden they'd have to like hold the kid and then that would look bad for them. And, you know, so... I think they were looking out for themselves. I think that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, I, I try to put myself in their position too and try to be fair about the situation because I think there's always something good to be said about something bad. I know that's weird, but um, I'm a, a hope, hopeless optimist, right? I always think about things as positive as I can. Um, but if that, and if that never happened, I would have never probably joined martial arts. I would have never been able to impact a lot of people with the work that I do. I would have never met the people that I've met and had the experiences that I've had. So I'm really grateful uh, in the long run that I had the opportunity to go down that path. Now, that was my decision. 
So a lot of people will be like, well, you should be grateful they beat you up. Like, no, fuck no, I'm not. Like, I'm not grateful they beat me up, right? But I'm grateful for the opportunity to see who I was as a person because that could have very easily gone down a different path. I could have very easily committed suicide at that time. I could have very easily gone uh, down a road that would have led me to things that were nefarious or not good for myself or people around me. So I'm grateful for the opportunity that life gave me. The bullies can kiss my ass. <laughs> like they, 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 if it wasn't for them, obviously, but at the end of the day, like they, there could have been other ways I could have gotten into martial arts. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But there's something to be said about the uh, adversity and and building people character. You seem to have a two two types of people: the ones who are really destroyed by it, by it, and the ones who kind of build a huge resilience and just go out there and they're very successful in the world. Yeah, that's the uh, nature versus nurture, isn't it? Like, uh, were you born with this ability to overcome and handle adversity in a positive way? Or did your environment and the the things around you and the people around you help mold you into that thing? So I think that maybe it's a little bit of both. But, you know, certain people, you know, you see these kids all the time, especially online now, because kids cannot escape bullying. When I was a kid, when I got done getting beat up at school, I'd go home and it was done. Um, I'd have to go back to school the next day, get beat up again. But at least I had a break. Kids nowadays don't get that break. They get beat up. It gets filmed. It gets put on the internet. Kids share it. Kids like it. Kids make memes of other kids. And then next thing you know, it's a 24-hour cycle. That's torture to anybody. Um, you know, this constant pressure that's happening to children nowadays, I don't think is fair. Um, do you follow Tom DeBlas? No, I don't. Tom DeBlas has this program called Buddies Over Bullies. And it is a fantastic program. He's got hundreds, if not thousands now, but hundreds of martial arts schools, specifically jujitsu, because he's a jujitsu guy, mm -hmm. who now are taking kids who have been like in these viral videos or kids who are getting beat up at school and they'll take them in and they'll train them for free. Um, completely changes their life. Uh, and I'm all about it. Uh, I'm not a spokesperson for them in any way, but... I love the program, and I think that I wish it was something that I had available as a kid. Uh, but kids yeah. now need it. For sure. Well, we're doing something similar, but for adults, so with people with mental health issues. Um, we've got free classes awesome. as well. well. I just come back from one. <laughs> so, That's awesome. yeah, so it is. Um, I read as well in your book about the crazy stuff in, uh, you know, adults club where you've been fighting in and it's an amazing story. If you guys want to read it, we have to get the book. We're not going to go in super details, but uh, that would that stuff wouldn't be able to do, done now, wouldn't it? No. It would, uh, it as fact, we, talk, we talk about it in the book. I'm sorry I have to blow my nose. It's like <laughs> killing me right now. That's I'm right. To... Rob, Rob going to blow the nose and I tell you to go and get the book because it's really interesting. And I think the, the best books are the biographies where you can follow people's um, stories and stuff. They're way more interesting than fiction. And as well, the uh, thing that occur in life, it's more stranger than uh, fiction can be created, I think. So if you can grab the book, it's available on Amazon or through Rob. I don't know if Rob's selling it or not. I'm just trying to fill the time when he's going to come back with the, when he blown his nose. <laughs> sorry so man wanna... that's all right no problem I appreciate, I appreciate you giving me a second um yeah so uh if you there's a there actually is discussed in the book it's a little bit more towards the end of the book we actually discuss like i me and uh the co-author his name's lewis martin and lewis martin is an amazing writer in my opinion uh, i read his book called the true believers years ago um, he actually sent me a copy, uh, which is super nice of him. I, I think it sat on my shelf for like six months before I was able to get to it. I got hired out to go to London and uh, I was teaching a seminar in London. So that's a long flight from Florida. So I get up and I just start reading the book and I, I can't put it down. It was like a fascinating book because it was about him. It was a biography about him being in a martial arts cult and the term true believers is related to people who are really in the cult. Like they believe whatever the cult leader says. And uh, at one time, 
himself, he was a true believer. He believed that this cult was the end all be all he he was taken advantage of along with other people. Um, but then randomly down the road, we start filming a documentary. I'm like, dude, I got to interview you because you were you belonged to a martial arts cult. This is what it's about. And then after that, I found out that he's writing Tom DeBlas's book, which we just talked about Tom DeBlas to bring it full circle. So I was like, hey, kind of have a story about my life that might be interesting to people. Would you be willing to write it? And he did. We went back and forth. We're both very particular about the way we want things done. So, uh, but super happy with the result. And at the end of the book, it was something that was important to me is that we actually put a few headlines from articles that were in news stories at the time uh, to kind of back the things that we're talking about. Like these were real, like this really happened. I tried to add photos instead of quotes. So at the beginning yeah. of every chapter, there's a photo to kind of prove like, look, this happened, uh, including a photo of my instructor on fire. Um, mm -hmm. So be prepared for that. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was an absolutely crazy time in my life. And because of that time, the way that people handled boxing in the United States completely changed. Um, and as talked about in the book, there were deaths that did occur. Um, and because of that, it completely changed the way that they handle not only amateur boxing, but even uh, into pro boxing and uh, state athletic commissions had to change the way they did things. So you will never in the United States, at least currently, be able to do what was happening at that time, which was two on two fights. I talk about one of those in there. I have a video of that on my YouTube channel. Um, we talk about, uh, you know, being able to do fire demonstrations inside that didn't but go so well. We You've got a video of that as well. I think you post put it in one of your real videos. I've seen it. It's like, wow. Yeah, like I, I, I wanted to make sure like something that's important to me is that the story was as legitimate as humanly possible. Mm. It's very important that these things, the way that it was written and the way that I felt and the way that things happened, that was what happened. Um, and there's only two stories in there that are two stories blended, but they did happen. Um, so other than that, the, the book is from start to finish verbatim what happened. So when we start talking about my instructor setting himself on fire, like that is exactly how that went down. I have a video of it. So if anybody reads the book and then you go watch the video, you'll be like, oh, my God, like you might read the book and go, did that really happen? And then you watch the video you're like, the crap, that actually did happen. Or the uh, the two on two fight. I talk about that. And then people are like, did that really happen? Like, here's a video. <laughs> so I'm fortunate to be born in this age where I had access to camera equipment and we had access to, mm -hmm. to you know, computers. So we were able to have all these things. It's wild. I even have a, a video of my very first boxing match, which is amazing to me. And I talk about that, which is a hilarious story to me. Um, it was just all very interesting time in my life. Did you, when you've been writing a book, based on your memories and did you struggle to or did you have the doubts that you remember it correctly because for example i was writing book from when i was seven years old up um and that time you know when you're younger i was like kind of questioning myself is that really happened or did i'm saying it completely different than it actually went but so i i saw that saying that you know this is how i remember it might be not 100% accurate, but this is no my... different. So that was Lewis's uh, uh, intro to the book. So that was not me writing that. That Louis talks about how he's interpreting what I'm saying to him. So the way that the process worked is why he wrote that. So we wrote this book starting during COVID because we had nothing to do. <laughs> like, what, what are we going to do? We're sitting around. Like, I make content in martial arts schools. They're all closed. So what am I supposed to do? So I started doing a bunch of content behind the camera. But during that time, we were, in the, again, in the middle of filming a documentary. This, the COVID hits. We're like, oh, my God. Like, what are we supposed to do with, like, all this time? So I reached out to him and we started. But this was over the course of almost three years of writing this book. So I would give him notes. I'd just send him voicemails. He'd ask me a question he'd, and, and I'd, I'd answer. They'd be like, hey, tell me about this story. You, you were talking about this before. And then I'd tell him the story. So we'd go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So by the time it's done, it's like a mixture of the way that he writes, which I love the way he writes. It's a mixture of the way he writes and how I feel. 
And so, you know, some of the things in there, uh, when it comes down to it are, again, they seem maybe extraordinary. Like maybe these things couldn't have happened. Like I'm a 15 year old kid fighting in a bar. Like, yeah, right. No, that happened. Like I have evidence of that. Right. But it's done through his writing. And so the way that he writes is not the way that I talk. And I think that it makes it so that way it just, it kind of makes it seem so much bigger than it really was, but there it's all true. All of it's true. It, it is very nice uh, read. I did, I did really enjoy it. I, I'm reading in the evenings and it's like, oh no, it's time to sleep, but one more page, one more page, <laughs> one more page. So I really, really enjoyed it. Um, th all this, experiences definitely had an impact on you um can you talk about you know what kind of mental health impact the martial arts had it on on, on your well-being and mental health uh, that was a weird question um man that's actually a fantastic question um i guess it's been more like a roller coaster like um in terms of mental health but but that's mostly by choice so when I started martial arts, I was at a very low point in my life. Like, and that was at 12 years old. You know, I was constantly getting beaten on, constantly getting picked on, uh, getting jumped. I still have, I talk about getting stabbed in that that first initial jump biting. And I actually still have a piece of pencil lead, at least the mark in, in my finger from that, where I tried to stop them and they stabbed me in the hand. But mm -hmm. going through that, that, that was a really crappy part of my life. That sucked. Going to school every day felt like going to prison. I felt like I was being punished to go get an education. And that's, I don't think anybody should feel that way. I don't think anybody should go to a place for higher education or for education in general and feel like you're in danger every day. And that's how I felt. So I had like really bad anxiety that still comes and goes. Uh, that has never gone away, especially in big crowds like Sometimes it's very controllable. I take a breath. I'm good to go. It's much easier to manage as I get older. But then, you know, because I was always in these big crowds, that's when bad things would happen. So that's when I'd start freaking out. So at that time, I'd shake uncontrollably while I was in school because I just knew somebody was going to do something. It was just a matter of time. It happened every day. Um, and then I started martial arts and this like very odd thing happened. I don't know why or when or where it happened. I just know that it did. I just stopped fighting. It was so weird. Like I'm talking every day there was an argument or a fight or this or that or getting jumped. But then I started martial arts and it just seemed to stop. And it wasn't like I told people I did martial arts. I specifically didn't tell people because I was hoping like I was hoping that maybe someone would do it and then I could test yeah. this out. Like, all right, well, I couldn't fight before. Maybe I can now. Let's see what happens, right? So it was like a self-experiment for myself at a very young age. So something happens in martial arts to you that's a very hard thing to describe. It's not necessarily the most tangible thing, and it's not something you're really even taught. It's just something you learn. For instance, you might be taught to tie your shoes, right? But you learn very quickly that if I throw you in the pool and your head goes underwater, maybe you should hold your breath. No one has to teach you that. <laughs> You'll figure that out on your own, right? So that something happens in martial arts where randomly you start to feel more confident. And I think it has a lot to do with why people are terrified of public speaking. Just my personal opinion. I think people who are scared of public speaking are afraid that they're going to get up there and say something that will make them look bad. They'll get up there and forget what to say. They'll get up there and say something that's not correct. And so they're terrified of the outside world and how they view them. And they're also scared that they themselves are not knowledgeable in the thing they're talking about. Martial arts gives you this weird knowledge of if me and you get into a fight, I have an idea of what's going to happen here. I might not know. You might knock me out, maybe. But I have a litmus test. I've sparred and fought over and over and over and over and over again. I've put myself in those situations on purpose over and over again. And I've been hit and I didn't fall down. I've hit other people and made them fall down. Maybe if this happens, chances are good. I have more experience at this. So I feel more confident. It just naturally happens. No one walks into a martial arts class and says, you're more confident today. It just doesn't work that way. It's, it's a gradual thing. And so that started happening, I think, looking back. And so it made my mental health feel great. I had a place where no one cared about what I looked like, which was a big deal to me at the time. 
No one cared how I spoke if I had a speech impediment, which I do. No one cared about my political views. No one cared about my race. No one cared about my sex. No one cared about anything but this one task that we're all trying to make each other better at. Once you stepped on the mat, nothing else mattered. And it was such a beautiful experience. And it still is every time I walk on the mat. I just, that feels comfortable because none of that other outside crap matters. So to me, martial arts is a very sacred thing. It is very, something I think we should protect and it helps my mental health. But then of course, I start Mar I start McDojo life. And then it goes, ah, not so good. Because then I have to see the rapes and the murders. And then I have to hear about the pedophilia. Then I have to hear about the con artists. And it's every day. And so for about two years of running McDojo life, I just stopped training. I was like, I can't do this. Like there's, I could not see the positive in it anymore. But then, you know, I start looking around at all these people and I start thinking about my own story and I start thinking about how this is affecting other people in a positive way. And then it reminds me, man, even though I'm purposely diving into the dark side of this industry, it does do great things for people. And so it just kind of brought me back. So now my mental health is back up. So hopefully it'll stay that way. And, uh, you know, I don't see anything super horrific in the next like year. And then I can, you know, feel that again because it's a good feeling. Yeah. But I, you know, you, you need to look on the positives. You, you're saving people from a nut jobs. And here is apologies from the karate person. We're not all nut jobs. I know that karate is very um, good breeding ground for a. Uh, but intended people and it's easy to hide within the ranks of karate because of so much um so many offshot splits and everybody can create own and lack of regulations i believe that instead you don't have a regulations in in teaching like in uk everybody can get a black belt and teach right well technically uh, around the world like as a whole there is no regulating body to martial arts now, within certain arts, they have maybe small regulating bodies. Like, for instance, in jiu-jitsu, you have like the IBJJF, right? People recognize them as some type of governing body in some way, right? But they don't just go to schools and say, you're not a black belt anymore. Like, that's just not something they do. Or, uh, you know, safe sport. I, I love safe sport. I think safe sport is probably one of the best organizations you really can have in terms of regulating pedophilia, like Go get safe sports certified. You get your background checks, all that good stuff, right? But most places I've been around the world don't have a legitimate standard for starting a school. Um, are you familiar with Xu Dong? So once I start the, telling the, you... The, the name rings the bell, but not... not. But in, for example, in Poland, when I was used to live in Poland, uh, that's where I came in, come from. We had the national qualification, so you you wouldn't be able to teach if you didn't have a national uh, uh, qualification done by one of the universities. So there was uh, universities of sports education issuing a qualification to teach anybody. So you have to have a, a at least minimum course to teach anybody. Yeah, I would love to see something like that. Um, the only reason I brought up Xu Dong. He's the gentleman in China who's been fighting the fraudulent martial arts instructors. Oh, and yeah, 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 yeah. Um, crazy. He has the craziest story. And I promise you, one day I will write a biopic about him. He deserves a movie. Um, he was, but, he was blo blocked from traveling, isn't it? He's got a lot of yes. problems in China because of uh, embarrassment of the traditional martial arts or something like that. Wasn't yes, it? absolutely. He's uh, To them, he was public enemy number one, but they couldn't kill him. Because technically he wasn't doing anything necessarily illegal. And then they couldn't kill him because then he'd be a martyr. So they were just like, oh, well, you just kind of proved his point. So what they did instead was they dropped his social credit score to like as low as you can get. He can't ride public transportation, I don't think. I don't think he's allowed to leave the country because his passport has been expired and they won't. They, they're not letting a lot of people renew passports anyway, but he won't be able to. Um, I don't think he's allowed to own property or own a home. Um, like they really just kind of did a number on him and all for the fact that he's standing up for his convictions in a different way. I mean, he, he fights frauds. I personally have been looking into how cults work. I know that if you beat up a cult leader, you're not going to stop the cult. The only way to do that is you have to cut off the supply. If you can cut off the supply early, you can stop the cult. But anyway, when it comes down to this, the reason I bring him up is because because of him, 
China passed a law, which is you, anyone can look this up. They passed a law where you are not allowed to call yourself a martial arts master unless you get approval from the Chinese government. It's, it's mind blowing. So this one guy and what he did in a way did make the impact that he was hoping to make. But of course, that's usually that's really just a smoke screen for the Chinese government to say, hey, we never approve that guy. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 he's yeah. not real Over master. Their asses, isn't it? Exactly. So, I mean, but it's interesting because you can make a difference. You can make an impact. You can change regulation. You can change policy. I think that there should just be a couple things. I, I really love safe sport. I think safe sport's probably one that they should incorporate everywhere. I think that you should have a, a local or federal background check before you're allowed to teach. And that should be re-upped every, let's say, six months um, or two a year. Um, and I also think you should be CPR and first aid certified. We're in a very physical art. Things happen. You should be able to take care of basic first aid. Um, and then if, you know, if you wanted to step it up even further, uh, maybe even a teaching degree. Um, so that way you're not just randomly beating on your students, hoping that they learn. Um, you're actually teaching them like a teacher teaches, you know? So I don't, I don't know that I think basic regulation can save a lot of lives. So in, in UK, you must have a, uh, first aid if you want to have an insurance. So most of the guys are. Uh, having first aid we have a renewal uh, next month for our our team from myself and my friend um, you have to be dbs it's called dbs check so it's like a background check but that is renewed every three years uh, but you know this is uh, it really you can hide with that as well because it's only if you've got a conviction so right if you don't if you haven't been caught you're clean right but that's better than nothing um so and plus there's no specific martial arts teaching qualification but i went through the route of um getting a personal training qualification and kettlebell so i went the other way plus i've got a qualification from poland to work with children like on the summer camps and how to coach and plus done a disability coaching course so i'm trying to be legit as much as i possible and you know keep in check my uh, myself you you seem to have like what they call the white belt mentality, which is a good mentality to have, which is there's always something to learn. Um, and I think that if more martial artists would take that into consideration, hey, there's still more for me to learn. Just because I have this black belt on does not mean that I'm the greatest teacher in the world, or it could be the opposite. You might not be the greatest teacher in the world, but you're a fantastic competitor, um, or you're not a good competitor, but you're a fantastic teacher. Um, you know, they don't... I think that it just kind of boils down to one thing when I do business consulting for martial arts schools, give a shit, just care. If you just care about your students, you will always be looking for a way to make this better for them. It's not about us. If it was up to us, we'd probably just sit around. We'd probably eat Doritos, watch Kung Fu movies, and get out there, get the paycheck and come back. But it's hard work. It's a, it's a very physical, demanding job. And as you get older, your body will not be able to do the things that it used to be able to do. And having that realization early, I think, will make you a better teacher. Because then you won't look at the guy who's 50 years old who comes in twice a week and say, you got to compete. Like, no, he doesn't. He's got a herniated disc. What he needs to do is he needs to work out a little bit, man. Or, like, look at the guy who's morbidly obese and go, work harder. Like, he showed up. <laughs> like, he needs to lose 30 pounds for a gastric bypass surgery, man. Let him work. Like, if you keep grinding on him like this, you will eventually wear him down. He will quit. Like, give a damn about your students, and then they will succeed. I think that's an easy thing to follow, in my opinion. Yeah, that's the one of the things that I, I my friends calling me a uh, troll hunter because I like to have a conversation with trolls. I'm always very polite and always invite them to my mental health project, and they suddenly disappear. But this is like, you know, oh, you old guys doing this and say, like, yes, I'm over 40 years old. My body says to me, fuck you. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> My 20 year old inside says, yes, we can do it. And then, you know, exactly. people don't understand that, especially young people. I think, they think. I think they're, I think that that's like, it's another thing that's a cliche that older people say, right? As we get older, we just start saying, you don't get it yet, kid. You don't get it in like 15 years. But that's true. Like, Especially, I started when I was 12. 
So my body was still going through the developmental stage while I was training and competing and beating it up. You know, like I, I had, I think in the book, I talk about three concussions that I've had, if I remember correctly. Um, one of which I lost entire segments of my life that are just gone because of the, the brain damage that I had. So when people start looking at this thing and they start thinking it's all about the hoorah, tough guy act, it's not. If you do that enough, yes, there is a one in a billion chance that you might be the guy who succeeds that way. But most people don't. Um, and if you look at guys who are at the top, like look at Gordon Ryan. Yes, he's a hardworking guy. Yes, if I had to guess, he probably does some juice, right? And then, but also look at the way that he trains and look at his instructor. John Donna here is a very intelligent man. So he teaches people to train in a way that is more conducive to becoming better at the act. Um, if you're training that hard nose, you're always getting hurt in the gym. How are you going to be effective when you actually need to defend yourself with a broken arm or a torn knee? You're not going to do well in a street fight. Or let's say you're a professional fighter. Are you going to actually even make it to your fight? That training camp you worked so hard on and then you get injured and now you cannot make the payday? Well, now you can't be a pro fighter anymore because you're never making it to fights. So... I think people need to start training a little smarter when, when it comes to it, because you will get older. Do you really want to do this for life is the question you have to ask yourself. Mm. There's a huge change, positive change in UK. A lot of people changing now, the sparring methodology, including us, we spar every every session like BJJ do, but with punches, but we totally change the way there's no allowance for more than 20% of punches. It's more kind of touches. It's just not worth it. If you're not paid millions for being hit in the head, no no point doing it. Yeah, I, I don't do hard sparring anymore. Um, I just, you know, I, I, again, I'm getting older. The guys who are getting trained are young, strong athletes. Yeah. And I'm a guy who already passed that time in my life. I do it because I like it and I enjoy it. Um, and I like coaching. I like, I think that those guys need the hard sparring every once in a while because they're about to go in there and actually fight somebody for real. Sure. Um, and, but I think that for me, the hard sparring is just something I need to dumb down in my, in my career. Um, I don't enjoy it anymore. Like I used to enjoy like a good, like, let's go back and forth. Like, this will be fun. But now I get older and I'm like, now I just feel like shit. Like my head hurts, you know, I'm all busted. Um, you know, I want to be, I get up the next day and things to hurt, <laughs> you know, where when I was in twenties, you know, I get up and I'm like, Oh, black guy, oh, I'll be all right. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I joined the back to BJJ after a long break, and now it has fingers. I smashed them on the mat. That's two weeks now in pain constantly. It doesn't recover anymore. Just like, uh, why do I do that to myself? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, uh, I started in karate, and one of the things that we learned in that system was another system. So the karate that I did was called American Freestyle Karate, which is very much like a Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, Benny the Jet, or style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't do kata, we just did kickboxing basically. So most of the techniques are conducive to that. Um, but then we also had a nunchuck thing that we did. So you our instructor really, really good at it, didn't you? Yeah, you know, I got well, I got lucky. <laughs> the instructor that I had, they did a poll. There's a there's a website called freestyleform.net. And freestyleform.net is a nunchuck site. And all they do is like nunchuck aficionados from all over the world will challenge each other to try techniques. They'll uh, give themselves like leaderboards and like conversation. It's great. It was great. I really enjoyed it in my early 20s, right? I was on there all the time trying stuff. But my instructor, they did a, a poll. They said, who is the, the greatest nunchuck artist of all time? And they said, number one was Bruce Lee. I said, number two was Michelangelo from the Ninja Turtles. And they said, number three was my instructor. Cool. And so Lee Barton. And so when I asked him about it, I was like, how does it feel? You made the top three. He's like, ah, technically I'm number one. And I said, how do you feel? Why do you, why do you think that? He goes, well, Bruce Lee's dead. <laughs> so he's not here anymore. Michelangelo isn't real. He goes, so technically I'm the best. Like, <laughs> so, um, but he was very, very good and talented. And I got lucky to learn that system while I was learning karate. And I feel fortunate because not too many people really know that system. It's a very small community. Um, I'm only a third degree black belt in it. So chances are good unless by some miracle, someone's able to, to continue that lineage. Cause I don't even teach it for rank anymore. 
um, that it might even be an art that dies. So I'm I'm very grateful that I have a black belt in that. Oh, cool, Rob. Uh, I'm gonna have to shoot off to the, the my kids to the gymnastics and stuff. I'm sorry that I didn't have m more time, but you know, fitting both of our schedules is you very busy person, and I'm getting busy. Um, thank you very much. I hope that we're gonna have a chance to talk in the future again. Um, where people can find you and when they can buy the book. Yeah, man. So you can check out the book. It's Sensei's Bars and Scars. You can get it on Amazon. Um, if you do check out the book, I would appreciate a review. It helps us out tremendously when you say how much you love the book, if you did. And if you didn't like the book, keep that to yourself. <laughs> but uh, uh, Sensei's Bars and Scars, you can check it out on Amazon. It'll actually be available on multiple different platforms after today because we're going and getting that put on uh, target.com and walmart.com it's going to get put up everywhere after today so we're excited about that um you can check out mcdojo life at mcdojo life on pretty much any uh any social media mcdojolife.com exists now so there is a registry there we can check out and type in your instructor's name to see if they've committed any type of nefarious act or broken any laws uh look for the symbol you find the symbol that's really us mcdojo life cool. amazing thank you very much Appreciate you.